going to tell you a lot more about the lions in the area because we've got a big map. So Jamie is quite correct. So we're currently in the Mara Triangle. So we're going to go through the prides. So this right up in the top corner of the pride, underneath that picture of that beautiful girl, is the Ololololo pride. Then this area here is the Angama pride. Then this area here is the Sausage Tree Pride. And this area over here is the Mogoro Pride. And then we're going to go down here. This is the Ingiro Are Pride. Then we've got a very big pride down here that goes like that, called the Border Pride. The center area here is the Egyptian Goose Pride. I'm going to change around. And around here is the Purungat Pride. And then over here is the Paradise Pride. And guess what? I'm not even done. Here, the Ridge. So here, the Ridge Pride. Here, the Marsh Breakaway Pride. There, the Marsh Pride. And uh, here we look where we are. This is still Ridge Pride, Ridge Pride. And then we have the Riquero Lions here. Then we have. Oh yes, there's a very big pride down here. The Salas pride. And we have the Black Rock pride. And uh, then we have, oh, this is a hard one to say. I can't remember how to say it. Well, there's another big pride along this little river here. And, and then there's more prides going outside. So there's easily over 300 lines in this whole area. But it's this area we're working in here. There's probably 120 to 150 lions that operate just in the Maasai Triangle, forgetting the rest of the Maasai Mara. Balan would like to know how many mom lions I know about. Lots. Lots and lots and lots. So, to give you an example, some of the prides are up to 19 um, big. The Silas pride is actually over 30 lions. So, it all depends on the pride. But your average group of mom lions in a pride in this area seems to be five to eight lionesses their cubs the male coalitions which live with the prides can be anything from two to six all depends on what's going on isn't that absolutely fascinating that we're able to know and learn so much about these lions now the lions jamie is looking for are these lions up here they are called the angama pride and they are four adult females so four moms and ten babies. Some of the babies are as big as long as my sword, so very little and fluffy and cute. And some of the babies are a bit bigger, sort of the size of your dog. And there we go. So that's who Jamie's looking for. Hopefully she finds them soon. Scott is looking for a cat that's full of spots, but I don't have any pictures on my board of a leopard. So let's go see if he can show you one. Well, I really do hope either Jamie can find the lion or I can find a leopard or both for you guys. We are very, very lucky in this area. It is a great place to see, especially lion, but also leopard and cheetah. So we're very, very fortunate to be exploring here with you. And if we don't find you any today, you'll have to ask your teacher very nicely if you can maybe tune in again for us to show you another day but there's something that i don't think you've seen just yet some warthog and watch when they run away they hold their tails up in the air oh no they've stopped but what they'll do is they'll hold their tails up and that allows the ones behind the leader to follow them so it's a good following signal or sign and imagine how scary it must be knowing that there's lion and leopard after you and you have to walk through grass that you cannot even see over but what's interesting and what we can learn from this is that even though they cannot see their senses are so good look at how they stop sniff smell the air listen before they carry on and that's how they survive if they didn't have an incredible sense of smell and incredible hearing it would be very very difficult for them to survive out here Look at that nose. It also helps them find a lot of their food. They'll dig with that nose to find food once they've smelt it. 
They'll dig out roots and small bulbs. They'll sometimes go down onto their elbows. Oh, are you coming to say hello? Did you just hear Mount View Elementary were watching and now you'd like to come and say hello to them? Very good. I'm sure they're very happy to, to meet you. Oh, <laughs> she changed her mind and there you get to see that tail going. <laughs> Wonderful. Hello, Sandra. You would like to know why the hair is longer on their backs. And I guess maybe many, many years ago when they used to have more hair, like maybe like a bush pig, that part was also bushy. And if you think of animals like the zebra and the giraffe, a lot of them have got a bit of a mane along their spine. So it's not uncommon for animals to have a bit of, a bit of longer hair along their spine. Even some of your fathers might have hairy backs. So, it's a trait of a lot of animals to have longer hair along their spine. Maybe that's to protect the spine because the spine's so important. Oh, look here, this one's just come out of its hole. And Ellen, you would like to know why do warthogs have tusks? And that's for protection against other animals. They will use them to attack animals that attack them if they aren't too big, like leopard and cheetah. And they'll also fight amongst themselves, especially the men. This is a young boy here. Maybe he's just been kicked out of home and that's why he's making a, his own new home. You can tell that he's a boy because he's got two of those funny bumps coming out of the side of his jaw above his white moustache. The females will only have one of those bumps. But I think this is a young boy. He still has some growing to do. Those tusks are still very small. And you can see all that sand that's been freshly excavated. So what I want to do is just wait a moment. Because I'm thinking he heard our vehicle when we drove past. And he popped out just to see who was popping into his neighborhood. And he might reverse back in there. And we're going to see sand getting flung out of this hole as he excavates it deeper. Oh, it's looking promising. Let's see if we don't get any sand getting shot out. Oh, no. You changed your mind at the last moment. And off he goes. Hello, Stefania. Oh! Well, that explains it. I think that's Dad. That's a big male warthog. And I think Dad may have come and chased this one out of its hole. Or who knows what's going on. But there was some interesting action there. And the big ones continued to run off. Interestingly. Sorry, Stefania. You would like to know if warthogs ever eat meat. And yes, interestingly, they do occasionally. And it's not uncommon for the pig family to eat a little bit of meat. They are omnivorous. I've seen them chewing on hide before from leftover kills. So yes, they will. But it's not something that happens very commonly, or at least not that I've seen. Oh, it's dusty. Hello, Sandra. Are you interested to know why the warthogs decide to live underground? And it's a good question. The reason being is mainly for safety. They can reverse into those holes at night, leaving their sharp tusks facing forward. So if anything tries to come in, they meet the dangerous end of the water first. And it's just somewhere safe for them to sleep. Especially also when they have young little piglets. It's another good spot for them to stash them away. So it's mainly for safety. Okay, well Brent's busy doing some research and he'd like to share whatever he's researching with you. Hello, welcome back. Yes, 
And uh, I know there's so many animals out here. That's what makes one of this place the most fantastic places in the world to be on a live African safari. Uh, and someone was asking how many mammal species. Brooklyn, that was it. Brooklyn was asking how many mammal species do we have? Lots, Brooklyn. So generally when we talk about mammal species and what you normally see on the list is going to be the big ones, such as elephant and lion. And of course, there's smaller cat species like serval. But on, on a whole, there's probably close to over 150 mammal species in the Maasai Mara. Now, not all of those are big, hairy, and scary. A lot of them will be tiny, like little fat mice that can be this big um, to shrews. And uh, oh, there's just so many myriad, which is the scientific name for the rodent family. And uh, then you've got hares bush babies now bush baby is very cool it's like an ape you've got monkeys baboons and of course the big ones in the horse family we've got zebra and then in the antelope family wildebeest thompson's gazelle grant's gazelle impala uh, dick dick oribi topi heart beast and, and the list goes on and on so there are many many different species and we're tr as we spend more time here we're going to learn more about how many species there are in total and that is very exciting for all of us now let's go across to jamie who's got another species i do indeed i've got lots of members of the same species and these are buffalo and the buffalo are enjoying a spot right next to the water They've all settled down for an afternoon nap, although some of them seem to be waking up once again. So this is a mixture of, oh, and there's three species in that picture. The giraffe at the back, here it goes wandering through, and then a topi antelope in the middle, and the buffalo. And speaking of giraffe, just a quick answer to the question that I answered earlier. I asked you what a group of giraffe is called. It is called a journey or a tower of a giraffe. So that is what a group of giraffe is called. And there's a whole group of them now, a whole journey of giraffe going out on their own safari. Off they go into the distance. The buffalo aren't planning on walking anywhere just yet. They're still enjoying a little bit of a wallow. And if we have a look in front of me, you can actually see some of them have been lying in the water. And you'll see lots of them have dried up patches of mud on their skin. And that's because buffalo like to cool down and coat their skin in thick mud. And basically acts as a great way to shelter their skin from the sun. So kind of like a sunscreen in a way. But also, more importantly, to pick up any parasites that they might have in their fur. And then the parasites that are stuck into their skin can't breathe because the mud is so thick. So they let go and they drop off. And then the buffalo finds a nice tree somewhere and has a really good scratch and scratches off all of that dried mud. The buffalo love spending time in the mud. And if we look a bit to the right there, Dave, just a little bit, there's a baby buffalo. Further right. There we go. And Belland, while we look at a tiny, tiny, tiny baby buffalo, you want to, oh, cute, that is really sweet. Um, you want to know what the purpose of a giraffe's long neck is. Well, one of the reasons is the fact that it can reach up to the top of the trees. But actually, one of the big reasons why giraffe have long necks is because that's the way they fight with each other. The males especially, well, actually the males only, the males swing their heads around and they hit each other on the sides or on the legs. And they only do that when they're fighting over a female. So they'll swing their heads around and they'll knock the sides of their opponent. And because their necks are so long, the longer your neck, the more momentum they can gather. And therefore, the harder they can hit their opponent. So those are the reasons that a giraffe have long, long necks. And while we watch an antelope in front of us, Orlando, you want to know what do antelope eat? Well, Orlando, different types of antelope eat different things, but all of them 
are herbivores. So some antelope eat only leaves, some antelope eat only grass, and some antelope eat both leaves and grass. So in this case, the topi antelope eats mainly grass. But they're all vegetarians. They're all herbivores. Hmm, very good question coming through from Clayton. Clayton, you say with all of these animals out here where we are, do we have pangolins? Clayton, we do have pangolins. I haven't seen one here yet, but apparently there are lots of them around, lots of aardvarks, lots of aardvulks. And that's a wonderful thing because, of course, a pangolin is an endangered animal and something that we really, really want to protect. Oh, unfortunately, for the school joining us for Mountain View Elementary, you kids have to go back to school now. So I'm going to say goodbye to you for now. And for all of our regular viewers, stick around. Don't go anywhere. Kids, I hope you have a wonderful school day further. Right. There we go. And back on our regular safari, our don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. If you know where the lions are, please tell me on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter because they were seen half an hour ago by James and Co. coming back from the airport. They've gathered up Fergus after his sudden departure from Juma and his arrival here in the Mara. And they all saw the lions. They've told me exactly where they saw the lions. Those lions are not there. Unless I am completely completely crazy which I think we've established this morning that I'm not because I still have my marbles They're, those lines are not there <laughs> they're somewhere they're in the drainage I'm sure they've gone down for a bit of a drink and maybe some shade but all of them I guess but they're gonna come out so I'm not going to wander too far away <clears throat> I'm going to stay in this area and see they're going to pop out as it gets a bit cooler probably in the next half an hour or so would be my guess Dave what do you think? Yeah. yeah, maybe. I say not maybe. I say definitely, since they had absolutely no success this morning. What do you think, Buffalo? So while I wait for the lions to magically pop out, and I'm sure they are going to magically pop out, I wonder if Scott's got any more definitive plans. <sighs> So no joy with the leopard along the edge of that riparian forest. And now we're going to head into the kind of area where Jamie is and try and give her a hand finding those lion. So that is the plan. It's taken my eyes quite some time to adjust to the expanse. Not used to being able to see so far, so it's a bit of a test. This is the little wallow some of you may have been watching when there was a hummercorp hunting and it managed to catch a catfish that was out of there. Maybe it's already caught all the fish out of there and it's moved on to another puddle. It seemed to be guarding it quite closely when we returned later that day. We saw it catch a fish in the morning then came back in the afternoon and its crop was full of fish you could see it was bulging out yet it was still staying there to make sure no other birds came in and helped themselves I'm guessing Let's see if we can work out. These birds, they look like yellow-throated long claws. The one's got a little bug in its mouth. What's that? A grasshopper, it looks like. Is it still calling with the grasshopper in its mouth? I think it could be. It is. <laughs> well, so much for not speaking with your mouth, Phil. It's not applicable in the long claw family. 
but I'm guessing they've got a nest somewhere in this bush. They might be a little bit nervous to go in and drop the food off while we're here. They're very clever like that. But let's just be a little bit patient. You can see there's two of them. There's one just on the other side. So they're obviously having a discussion between one another. Saying, is it okay? Should we? I wonder where the nest is. It could well be right on the ground. I think they do nest on the floor. And whenever you see birds flying around with food or anything in their mouth, you know they're doing one of two things. They're either building a nest, they're either carrying nesting material, or they're carrying food back to their chicks. Ordinarily, as soon as they catch something, they'll gobble it up before something steals it from them. Let's reverse a bit and see if we don't give it a bit more space if it doesn't change its mind. That's how we ended up finding the nest I showed you earlier. We saw two adults fly in with two different kills and they landed on the road obviously in the vicinity of where the nest was and we just slowly reversed until eventually they plucked up the courage and thought it was safe enough to actually feed their youngsters so then we watched where they went and from there we went and inspected afterwards and found that little nest come on pop in it doesn't seem like this yellow-throated longclaw is going to play ball with us although Are you? Seems to have changed its posture a little bit. There we go. Come on. You'll probably find the chicks are squawking in there, knowing that there's a treat waiting, begging mum and dad to just deliver it into their mouths. Oh. It's definitely thinking about it. Come on. No? You can see it's definite. Oh. Well. <laughs> that didn't work out quite as planned, but it shows that they're very responsible parents and they do not want to give away the location of their nest to us. Fair enough. I'm fairly certain it's in this bush here somewhere. But that myth will not be busted today. Ah! Well, interestingly, Jamie's also looking into a bush, so why don't you go and find out what she's looking for? I am, but I've got something not in a bush, but in a tree. In the form of this massive raptor. It is absolutely beautiful. I wonder if this is one of the pairs of nesting pairs of Marshall Eagle that are around here. It is utterly massive and so incredibly so incredibly striking. We've just been speaking to one of the oh, the person who researches Marshall Eagles out here. And he's been telling us all about the way that he actually puts transmitters, solar powered transmitters on the backs of these eagles to the point that he can actually tell when they're hunting which I find phenomenal and it's going to do so much in terms of our understanding of the way that these beautiful birds work hello yes we see you peekaboo we see you behind that branch I'm afraid it's not quite big enough to cover your massive bulk still a youngster looking at us with great curiosity Dave Apparently they can tell by the data that the transmitters send them when the bird is rocking backwards and forwards and essentially goes into a full-on hunt mode. And it's been one of the most fascinating conversations that I've had out here with the Marshall Eagle researcher and where they nest, the fact that they know of all of the nesting pairs in this area. 
And, of course, we get the three big eagles around here, the marshals, the crowns, and the black eagles, or the varose eagles, all around the mountains where we live, which I find terribly exciting because, of course, the varose is my favorite bird of prey. I can't wait to see one. I can't wait to put one on camera, even if it's just flying over us. The big three. And I think once we get properly settled, we'll be able to spend a lot more time with these birds. And Stratton's actually offered to send us the GPS coordinates of all of the nest sites. So we'll be able to go and monitor them. Hopefully at some point see one of them hunting in the way that they do. They're such impressively large birds that they can hunt things like small antelope and baby impala, which is something I've never seen before and something that I would absolutely love to see. Here you got a fluffy head. Oh, James, that's a very good question, and I'm actually not sure. I'm going to pass that one on to Brent as well. James's question is, are there any raptor species that are completely endemic to the Mara? I don't think so. But I'm not 100% sure on that. I think a lot of the ones are ones that we see on Juma as well. Obviously the black-chested snake eagles, the martial eagles, airs hawk eagles, African hawk eagles, all of those sorts of birds. But I'm not sure whether or not there's any that are completely endemic. Perhaps there's a little raptor species, a little goshawk or something like that, that's endemic to the forests on the mountains. I know that there are sparrow hawks nesting up there, but I'm not sure as to whether or not there are any in completely endemic. I don't think so. Not in the area that we're in. There's Pell's fishing owls out here. There's bat hawks hunting in the mountains, apparently. Something I haven't, I mean, I've seen before, but something I haven't seen here yet. Wyatt. Wyatt would like to know why are birds pretty much the only monogamous animals? I guess they're not the only ones. You've got the jackals and the steenbok, although again, they will potentially be unfaithful to their unfaithful, if you can call it that, to their partners, if they happen to find themselves in a situation where they happen to happen upon a member of the opposite sex. So why are birds I think the statistic is something like 95% of bird species or 90% of bird species are monogamous in some way, whether that's seasonal monogamy or, like birds of prey, pretty much lifetime monogamy. I guess it's something that they've evolved in terms of the benefits and the difficulties of raising chicks and the benefits of investing time in raising those chicks for both spouses. Spouses? I guess you can't really call them spouses. Both, both, both the fathers and the mothers. But I actually don't know that question, answer to that question. It's an interesting one. Why is it that birds have evolved to be completely monogamous that way? Or most of them? Hmm. I'm sure it's the, the, I mean, the evolutionary benefit is relatively clear. Although you don't, the male doesn't get to spread his genetics, he does help to guarantee that his offspring survive. Whereas something like an impala, once the, the mating is over, he really has absolutely or pays absolutely no attention to the offspring whatsoever. But then impala have a much higher breeding rate, whereas birds breed more slowly. Certainly larger birds and birds of prey. Hmm... I'm going to think about that for a bit. Now, Olivia, who is eight years old, who would like to know if there's any birds that migrate from North America to the Mara. Not that I can think of. I'm thinking carefully to try and think if there's a species. Again, maybe Brent can think of one. I can't think of a species that comes all the way from North America. There's lots of swallows.
that come through from Europe and certain, it's a, in terms of birds of prey and their migratory route, particularly things like Wahlberg's eagles, it forms a very, very important route as they fly north up towards Europe and towards things like steppe eagles up towards Russia. But I can't think of anything that comes through specifically to the Mara from North America. I'm just thinking carefully. No, I can't think of one. Maybe Brent can think of one bird species that comes through. Speaking of Brent, perhaps he has an answer on that subject. Maybe he's got some thoughts as well on the monogamy of bird species. Hmm. So much to ponder when it comes to our feathered friends. Now, Jamie's raised some very good points. And I think the evolutionary advantage of the monogamous bird species sort of speaks for itself. And I was trying to think of a gregarious, uh, or not gregarious, that's the wrong, wrong term, um, polygamous birds, and uh, some of the starlings came to, to mind, as well as a uh, well, wattle starling in particular, uh, guinea fowl, uh, all the fowl families, Franklin, I'm not 100% sure of, but it is something very interesting to ponder. Now, on the vagrants and migrants and raptors, there are no endemic migrants, uh, I'm sorry, endemic raptors to the Mara. If I remember correctly, there's only one endemic raptor to the Mara, and that is the Scocos owl, which is an um, endemic to the Scocos forest. Now, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, variation in Scocos owls, and I'm going to see if I can find a picture of it just now. Taking a bit of time um, on my birding and thing of bulb. But um, in terms of other, there was another question whether there are any vagrants from North America that come to the Mara. No, not, my, not migrants, vagrants. So I say a little, little bit, but maybe we find. So migrants are something that come every year. Vagrants are once in a blue moon. Now you will definitely get coastal vagrants in Kenya. Um, certain of the golden plovers, American golden plover, and things like that that have been recorded in Kenya. Now in the Mara, I think probably, my mic has possibly fallen, excuse me, it hasn't possibly fallen in there. No, it hasn't fallen, has it? It has. Sorry guys. Let me put it back. Right, there we go. Stick, stick, stick. Is that, did it fall again? The gaffer's tape has lost its stickiness. There we go. Okay, all sorted. So I think there might be things like an American purple gallinule, um, and those will be sort of one-off records of those, those birds that are sort of arrive. Now, there are species that occur in both North America and Africa, and I think I saw one you know, on one of uh, James's uh, pictures here. No, maybe I was wrong. I saw the Goliath heron. What I'm looking for is a gray heron. A gray heron. Um, is in, uh, is, occurs on almost all continents except Antarctica. There are a couple of bird species that do that. Peregrine falcons, grey herons. Well, I know there's another one I'm missing that's blindingly obvious. And I thought of it a second ago. Okay, well, moving on. So I think there are probably a few vagrants, if not possibly one or two migrants, um, that might occur in Kenya. Whether it's in the Mara itself, I'm not too sure. Mm, something to... to to ponder, but I do know there's one endemic raptor, uh, which is an owl to Kenya, and that's the Sokoko Scops owl lit. Um, and I will find a picture for you just a little bit later. Now, of course, um, where we are now is quite interesting because we're right on the edge of the escarpment. Down where everyone is is around 1,600 meters above sea level. Where we are, it, and on these pinnacles here, it goes to over 2,000 meters above sea level. And very high rainfall and there's some incredible forests behind us here and here we even have some of the sort of right on the edge of their range congo bird species so seropses and diopuses and 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 warb and forest warblers and, and forest uh i just i can see them now looking at me cameropteras not cameropteras prinias forest prinias like robert's prinia and things like that so the birding up here is absolutely fantastic and, uh, it, and also as we move towards Lake Victoria, there's places in Lake Victoria where there's shoe bills and uh, in, in total Kenya has got a massive bird list. So the whole of South, Southern Africa has a bird list of 900. Now Kenya in terms of size is, is tiny and compared to Southern Africa. Southern Africa is Mozambique, Botswana, South Africa uh, 
and Namibia, well, of course Swaziland and Lesotho little ones. Kenya has got a bird list close on a thousand bird species for an area probably uh, a sixth of the size. And it's because of the varying terrain from those incredible coastal forests and of course the offshore, um, the offshore birds out of the ocean um, through to the dry athi plains around uh, Savo and the dry scrub bushland of Savo and also dry bushland up north into northern Kenya to Samburu where Scott was and also the Matthews range where you go from that dry scrub bush up to mountain forests again Lake Takana coming around towards the Albertine Rift um, and that's where you get a lot of these endemic species that occur Rwanda, Uganda and there's a bit of overflow into Kenya so it is an absolutely fantastic birding area Aaron is wondering, are there any chances of seeing a shubal in the Mara? Unfortunately not. I'm afraid not, uh, Aaron. Ah, I remembered what the other bird species that occurs all over all continents except Antarctica. It is the barn owl. There we go. I think there's about six or seven species that occur on all continents except for Antarctica. And that, I think I said three. I think peregrine falcons, grey herons, barn owls, and I'm getting old because I can't remember the rest. Now, let us go and see a triple scourge with Scotty D. Well, we just thought we would stop and relax with this giraffe as it chews the cud. Let's hope it continues to do so. I'm sure it will. And as we take a closer look, we'll actually be able to see it busy chewing, as it is now and shortly it will swallow and then we'll get to see one of my favorite things to watch in the African wilderness the next bolus of cud so it swallowed a little bit there I think it still might need to swallow a bit more or no, there we go, but drink did you guys see that next bolus come traveling up its neck into its mouth what a bizarre phenomenon that I am glad we as humans do not have to do although it does seem quite relaxing and I'm sure a lot of their sleep time is whilst they are ruminating or chewing the cud. They never switch off quite like we do as humans. They just doze and I think this lady is currently dozing as she chews the cud. Jamasana. So we are now heading into the area where we should be getting a little bit closer to where Jamie was with those lions this morning at least or at least where the the reports were from earlier so hopefully some added eyes patrolling that area will help us work out where they are they might be thinking about getting active soon because they were a bit hungry unless of course they've been successful during the day beautiful Just got a question through from, I think it's just pause, and you're interested to know if the giraffe ever migrates across the Mara River, and yes, I'm certain they do, they'll cross from time to time, giraffe are known to cross rivers, in some situations on slippery rocks they can sadly slip and battle to get up, there was an area in the Sabi Sands where I used to work where I started my career, and it was a spot called Taylor's Crossing. It was notorious for giraffes slipping and not being able to get back up, which the lions would obviously cash in on. And this morning, interestingly, I thought we may actually see some giraffe crossing, but they were just heading down to the river for a drink. But I'm sure as time unfolds, we'll be able to share a giraffe crossing with you.
Okay, we're just making sure we're not rushing around too much as we pass these guys. Jumbo Sana! Habari ya kile kitu? Umepata kitu? Bado. Acha sisi bado. Aya. Bye bye. So he's also had no luck yet this afternoon with the Lions. It's always a tricky one. We want to be friendly to everyone and say hello, but sometimes they don't know whether we're live or not. Hello to Chris. And your question comes at a good time because it's relating to Buffalo. You would like to know if the old big bulls are sometimes referred to as dugger boys, like this old individual. And yes, they certainly are. Dugger is a term used in South Africa for cement. And it's that kind of cement-like mud that cakes their body so often that has dubbed them that name. And I think it has spread from South Africa up to other parts of Africa, but I'm not entirely sure. You'll have to ask some of the local guides here if they know what a dugger boy is. It may just be a South African term that spread. And this is a mixed herd, not only dugger boys in it, there's a few ladies. The one to the left will be, a, yeah, there's a few good comparisons. You can see the ladies' horns are quite different. As I was mentioning earlier, they've got hair between where their horns meet. There's a perfect example, whereas the males have got that large boss of horn. And just like the giraffe, these guys are chewing the cud. Although it looks like there may be a youngster trying to nurse. Let's uh, see if you can find that one there, Senzo. There it is. Cute! A few little babies. I think that one at the back belongs to... Oh, that's the one I was thinking. It's got a yellow-billed ox pack here, interestingly, on it. It's the first one I've seen since I've been in the Mara. Wonderful! Now, you may be wondering why it's called a yellow-billed ox pecker, because it's got quite a bit of red on the end. But its cousin, the red-billed ox pecker, has an entirely red beak. And not quite as big and bulky as this one. Shoops! Very useful birds for the buffalo because they do a good job of removing the ticks and parasites from them. And isn't this little calf cute? So, all calm and peaceful here. And we'll leave them be. Thanks, buffles. Okay, so we shall be sending you back to Jamie for an update on the search for the Angama Pride. I have no update on the Angama Pride except that I'm going back to where they were in the hope that now that it's getting later they're going to pop out. But I have a track quiz for you. And this is a difficult one, especially because a couple of them walk down the road. Have a look at that track. And actually, Dave, if we go a little bit further along towards there-ish, there, there, exactly there, there's one individual track here. What made those footprints in the sand? Obviously, I can't get out of the vehicle to draw them for you or to draw the outline for you. But there's a track quiz that might just, maybe, maybe, just catch you out. I'm just looking behind me to see if I can see them, because those are quite fresh. And I'm sure I saw them earlier. But they appear to have vanished. So, what walked down this road? It can give you a hint it was not those elephants. It was most definitely not those elephants. And to give you a sense of scale, while we look at the elephants, the track is about... Hmm... I'm trying to work out distances here. I'm just going to do this. 
The longest point of the track is about that big. There you go. What is it? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. See if I've caught you out or if you're too quick for me. Been a while since I've seen one of those. Right, back towards where the Angama Pride were. Oh, well. So the other, just to give you a, an idea, the other night, the Angamas chased those zebra, or hunted those zebra into that line of trees up ahead. That's the one over there. And eventually disappeared to a point that I couldn't follow them any further. I then found them back on the other side of that marshy bit. And then they went back into that area, and they went a little bit to the right, and that was where they pulled the fast one on me, just at that sort of the ridge there where the grass is next to the trees, next to that line of trees. And that was where they went back to the cubs. That was where they made their second hunting attempt. And when they killed the zebra, they started chasing it there. I don't know where exactly the zebra was, but that's where they started chasing it. They killed it right outside Olololo Gate. But, I mean probably about 50 meters from one of the staff houses. That's quite a long way that they chased that zebra. That was just to give you some perspective. Okay, I'm going to start heading. We've got 45 minutes before the end of It is not a rhino and it is not a warthog. Both good guesses. I'll give you another hint. Um, the warthog, guess, has the right number of toes, but it's not a warthog. Quite a bit too big for a warthog track, that at the biggest is going to be around about that big. A rhino has three toes, and those show quite clearly in the track. So it's got one big toe in the middle, and then two on either side. So that's, it's not a warthog, and it's not a rhino. Rebecca, do you know what it is? Oh. Sorry, Bex, can you repeat that? You went a bit fuzzy there. JT Squeak and Izzy and apparently many others, you're far too quick for me. You are absolutely correct. It was indeed an ostrich. It was a couple of ostriches wandering down in... Oh! Found them! I knew I saw an ostrich somewhere. There we go. I wonder if it's the same one that... Um, was it Brent that had them dust bathing? There we are. Ostriches. Most certainly the same one that's, that left those tracks. So well done to all of you. You're far too quick for me. Could see the nail on the end of the claw quite clearly. And of course the big toe and the little toe on the side. Yes. Here's the male. And the female. Z. Females. I'm hoping at some point we're going to find an ostrich on a nest. And then we can see little ostrich chicks. That would be marvellous, wouldn't it, Dave? Okay, the call of the Angamas is pulling at my heartstrings. I know they're there somewhere. It's still quite warm, but that's never stopped them before. And I can see another vehicle stopped up ahead of me. I can't resist. I have to go and find out where they were and where they were hiding because they were definitely seen half an hour before Dave and I went and checked that point. Okay. Let's go find the Angamas. Chris, you want to know what do the ostrich eat out here? 
A lot of it is grass seeds and things like that. So they are pretty much herbivorous. Now they'll be plucking up bits of grass, seeds, roots actually as well. And then what ostrich also eat is stones. All birds will, or a lot of birds, will actually swallow small pebbles or small stones. Ostrich stones, the ones that I've found in ostrich stomachs before, have been easily just a little bit smaller than a golf ball. They swallow massive hunks of stone and they get worn down and smoothed out into perfect balls. And oh, I found the lions, Dave. For sticking with us. Ta da! Here's the funny thing. I drove past them twice. Scott's just driven past them once. I've driven past them a third time before they popped out and we realized that they were there. And there we go. <laughs> the Angama lion cubs. As to where the lionesses are, oh, your guess is as good as mine. But there are lion cubs there. So we might not have found the ladies, but we found their babies. <laughs> that sounded really weird. <laughs> Hello little ones. Thank you for showing up. I really appreciate it. The same seven that we saw on the sunrise safari this morning, they then dashed off and hid away. And we've got the little ones. Now I'm just wondering whether or not James and company actually saw the adult lionesses or if it was just the cubs that they saw. Um, perhaps if we could put forward some inquiries as to the answer to that. And perfect timing as well, Dave, isn't it? Oh, look at the little boy at the back with his tiny, tiny little mane that started to grow. All that fluffiness around his cheeks. Hey, little boy. You're terribly sweet. Aww. Hey, how come he's getting all the attention? I want some as well. Hello, beautiful cats. So, the seven Angama cubs. I'm very curious to know whether or not a Steph, oh, Steph, James, oh goodness, the name is always the first to go, Dave. Um, whether or not James and them, or Kirsty, or whoever happened to be in that vehicle, whether they saw the adult lionesses. They did say they were on this side of the drainage line, or that side of the drainage line. We're on the wrong side, as it happens. But I think I'm going to stick on the wrong side, actually. We've got a nice view. <laughs> oh dear. Rebecca, please tell Scott that he also drove past them. Speaking of Scott, <laughs> let's go and have a look at Scott's gorgeous view. Oh dear, it seems as though poor Scott has, well at least poor Scott's voice has disappeared off into the ether. Perhaps the power surge took his voice as well. As you can see, there are dark gloomy skies, Dave, in that direction. And generally speaking, that's the direction that the storms actually hit us from. I would say that one's about 20 minutes off, if that. It appears to be moving at quite the pace. But we shall weather it, Dave. We shall weather it. This one, I don't think we're going to be lucky. This one's not going to blow past us. This one is going to come smack bang into us. But for now, it's provided us with some really stunning scenery. Sun on the lion cubs, dark, grey, gloomy, dramatic skies. And hopefully... A stormy evening will mean success for the Angamas tonight. They technical issues but welcome back to this glorious view 
Now I have a challenge for the screenshotters out there. There have been some magnificent bolts of lightning. Not too many, but there have been a couple behind that giraffe. So we are going to sit here and patiently wait to hopefully show you one of these. It will also be nice if we do manage to capture one. We can maybe do a bit of a an instant slow-mo replay to see how it all unfolds at a slower rate so we can appreciate the lightning as it descends down to the earth come on it's always a bit of a gamble where to position the camera in situations like this but this does look like the darkest most likely part for another bolt to shoot out of Hmm. Have I slipped us into a dangerous scenario of now not needing, not wanting to leave until the next bolt flashes, which may never happen? Hmm. <laughs> Rebecca's just whispered in my ear that if this giraffe gets struck by lightning, she would be very sad, and that would be extremely unfortunate but I appreciate your humor Rebecca thank you for whispering that into my ear um, I thankfully think it would be a very random bolt of lightning it would have to travel a long way from the storm to seek out this giraffe so I think we are safe and I think we are so safe that I fear that we may not even see another bolt hmm my concern is is that I think the storm front is making its way towards us so we may have to scurry back to camp to try and get away from the downpour. Okay. No joy. Apologies for keeping some of you... Oh! <laughs> There was the bolt of lightning, perfectly framed, right in front of the giraffe. Oh well, there's good news, you're off to see some lion cubs. Lions in gold before the storm strikes, in a very picturesque setting, complete with beautiful Balanites trees as a backdrop. And of course the impending downpour that's making me more nervous by the second, Dave. There's some serious lightning out there. The cubs don't have to worry, but we might. In fact, I, th I think I agree with Scott in that uh, some scurrying is going to happen in the next... Mm, how long do you think we've got, Dave? Ten minutes? That's optimistic. The rain doesn't look too bad. Well, we'll find out. Right, this is the exact reverse of what happened to me the other afternoon, where James was sitting up in his tower, and it was pouring down, and we were in bright sunlight, and now we've got the exact reverse, where Brent at the top of the mountain has pure sunlight, and we've got something well on its way towards us. Patiently waiting for Mum to come back, or Mums, to come back. I'm still scanning the area as we're sitting here just to see whether or not those lionesses pop out. I haven't seen anything that's really close by that they might actually be interested in hunting. There's no zebra close by. There's no cokes today, or at least this afternoon. There's a couple of zebra up on the mountain that perhaps they might be focused on. So I'm just, lo I'm just looking every now and again looking around to see if there's a lioness about. Now the three little cubs are kept a bit further down this drainage line but not far and very soon they'll be settling down with the older cubs as well. Oh look at those Balanites trees so beautiful.
Now, Colleen, you would like to know if we can tell what's going to happen with the weather by the animal's behavior. To an extent, I think that... Oh, Linus. Found one. I knew one was going to pop out at some point. It was just a question of when. Sorry, Colleen. Obviously, animals do have a very distinctive sense of what's happening with the world around them. They're known for predicting earthquakes and things like tsunamis. There's sort of local weather conditions. There's not too much change in the animals. The birds tend to, if there's a really big storm coming, they tend to settle themselves in the trees and take shelter somewhere there. But I wouldn't be able to use them necessarily as a predictor as to what's going to happen. The lionesses most likely will now get up and go on the hunt once this weather hits. It's really, really good for ambushing prey. And prey gets panicky and confused when, when the weather actually hits properly. When it's storming and raining and the wind is howling, the animals get very panicked. And the lions and the hyenas take full advantage of that. Here she goes, slinking through the grass. I wonder if we're going to, we will see a joyous reunion between cubs and mum. She looks like she's got a fuller belly than the other, the, the first two lionesses that we saw this morning. Come on, girl. You didn't walk that far. <laughs> I mean, I get it is quite warm. Stop to have a quick break. There we go. On we go. She looks much... F mm -hmm. I think she looks much fuller than the other two lionesses that we saw properly. She might have been the one that was sleeping on the termite mound. And Deborah, you want to know when the last time was that this pride is eaten? I honestly don't know, Deborah. I would say that it was some time around last night, would be my guess. I don't think they caught a very big meal. But I, I reckon that they kill once a night, at least. That would be my suggestion. That would be my guess. So I would say they probably ate some point last night, and they're now on the search once again for food. Because with that many cubs around and that many mouths to feed, they have to be constantly moving and constantly searching for food. Oh, have we got another break? Where'd she go, Dave? Did she sit down? I think she might have sat down again. <laughs> no eager reception from the cubs. They haven't gone running off to go and give her a cuddle. Oh, she is going to get to the cubs soon. She's just popped out. She's still moving. Uh, I'm not sure, Bex, if you want to just see the reunion. Here she goes. She's coming out shortly. Hello. Come on, cubs. Go and say hello. Don't make mom do all the work. Go and give her a greeting. Okay. Less than enthusiastic. There we go. There we go. Or, you know, you could just ignore them completely. I guess it's not mum. Even then, a pride member should be enthusiastic to be reunited with the rest of her pride members. But she seems to be distracted by something else. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. No, all right. Cold-shouldered. Oof. What did you seven do to her? Hmm? One too many bites to the tail, huh? <laughs> Rejected. One cub's glancing longingly, longingly in her direction, but she's not interested. Okay, while well, we figure out where this lioness is, is going and if she's going to reunite with the rest of her pride, let's go back to Brent so he can tell you more about their territories. Growl. Now, this is probably one of the most famous lions in the world, Scarface. Uh, Tiziano was asking where is Scarface's territory. Now, this photo is by Jamesy. Um, he took it last time. 
Now, Scarface is Paradise Pride, and pretty much, if we had to go from there, if we had four of Scarface's pictures, let me just jump across, four of Scarface's pictures, his territory would do that, 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 and maybe even that. So originally he used to be up here around the marsh, and then he got pushed out by the current marsh males, and uh, he's been pushed by the full coalition of four up in the north, and he settled around a very good territory, around the main river crossings, and that's where he can be found. Oh, no, I, I don't want to put too many, I don't want to make too much of mess in James' studio, but there we go. So that's his territory there. Uh, with, along with the other three musketeers. Now let's see, Siko, Morani, and Hunter. Ha ha, I can remember all their names. And they uh, dominate this area around Paradise Plain. And then if we go up into the Ridge Pride territory, which is here, um, they've got some interestingly, ooh yay, sorry, some interestingly named uh, males there. I've, I've never myself, <laughs> well, I suppose it is their name and, and can't really change their name now. Blackie and Lipstick are the two dominant males here. And of course, our four triangle boys, um, well, that's what we've been calling them, we're not sure what to call them yet. Uh, Fang, half tail, since he's got half a tail. Blondie, and I cannot for the life of me remember the fourth. So, not all there just yet. Um, and then of down here, and two of the most magnificent boys, and I got to spend about three hours with them in the pitch black, roaring at me, waiting for them to hunt the other night. On top of Lookout Hill uh, are the Notch Boys. They are magnificent creatures. Big, black-maned beasties with a deep roar. Now, of course, then on the solid side, they've also got two dominant big black man males, and uh, up around here, the black rock males are also very, very impressive individuals. So uh, we're still getting to know, there's the Ronkai pride, which is in this area. I haven't seen the males from there yet, um, and I haven't seen the famous one-eyed lioness from there. Strange enough, much younger, but the uh, paradise pride have a one-eyed lioness as well, and I've seen her at the place where they've been keeping their cubs. So very, very interesting stuff. And of course, one thing is, every single day we're out there, we're going to learn something new about these beautiful big cats. Now, apparently Scott's competing with our view. Let's go find out. Well, I'm halfway up the hill, so not quite as impressive as the view that Brent is enjoying from this studio. But look at that. The contrast of those dark storm clouds. The green and yellow grasses, the dotted trees, an impala running in the foreground. Absolutely magical. And aren't we all so fortunate to be able to explore the magic of the Mara? I'm certainly loving every minute of it. And it wouldn't be the same without you guys with us, so thanks so much for joining us on these live safaris. I think we are going to be sending you back to Jamie. So I'm going to say goodbye for today. Thanks very much. It's been great. And I look forward to our next adventure. Also, thanks, Senzo. And well done to Rebecca in the final control. All right. Well, I think that very soon we're going to be emula emulating Scott's approach and racing for the hills. The weather gets closer and closer every time I look up. And whilst we are relatively waterproof, we're not entirely lightning-proof. And I don't particularly intend to find out whether or not it, we would survive. Never mind, you get the idea. So we will be racing off relatively shortly. But I just wanted to give you one last view of the lions. However, James's, <laughs> James's message from Final Control, presumably, is that we should hustle. I agree. I agree completely, James. That, um, that, that I don't really need much more motivation than that. I'm just going to send you the last, or give you one last view of the lion cubs, since they are, sorry, Dave, you got an idea of the weather. There's lion cubs. Say goodbye to the Angamas for now. We'll see them tomorrow, probably, most likely. Right. Let's go, Dave. Before the weather catches us. Luckily, we've got rain covers that prefer to be down than up. 
spent the entire drive trying to ambush Dave. I sometimes wonder if they haven't got a life of their own, because they seem to be trying to wrap themselves around Dave's neck at any one moment. Was it a little shop of horrors, that plant? Must have been. Oh, hold on. Time to hustle up the hill. I'm hoping that we don't get drenched too. That is very much... Look, we do have... We have covers that flap down, essentially making us one very large, very mobile tent. And a cause for much amusement on this reserve. The couple of times that we've driven around with our, all of our flaps closed. I can't, I can't see a windscreen wiper in Quito either, which would make things even more interesting. Let's get out of here. It seems that Brent is full of advice this afternoon. He tells me that the windscreen wiper is behind the seat on Quito. Let's go to see if he has any more words of wisdom. Well, this morning I had the bright orange sunrise, Shuka. This evening I have my deep red sunset, Shuka. Okay, now I did promise I was going to show you uh, the endemic bird of Kenya, although it's not truly endemic only to Kenya. It is endemic to Kenya and Tanzania. Jean-André, how is that for you? It is called the Sakuko Scots Owl. So there are quite a few different variations of Scots Owls through Africa. Uh, the most variant uh, happen to be in the rainforests. But there we go. It occurs only in a tiny patch. I'm going to change to the, the map. Two tiny patches of forest in Kenya and Tanzania. There we go. That is the most endemic raptor in East Africa. Now, tomorrow, so no one gets confused. We are going back to normal drive times that you are used to at Juma because the show will be coming out at Juma while us here in the Mara do what we do in the Mara where shukas stay up all night and such. Um, but of course, it is going to be exciting. I think there will be some Mara feeds coming out of us tomorrow. But uh, keep an eye up on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on the Safari Live pages if you are unsure on how the drive schedules are going to be working for the next little while. Geraldine likes a spreadsheet, she likes a timetable, she will be keeping you well updated. Now there was one other thing I had to tell you and now I can't remember. Rebecca, can you remember what was the last thing I had to tell you? I think it might be nothing from Rebecca, I think it might have been in my head. Yes, it was in my head. It was, um, unfortunately, we just didn't quite get the time to go into Maasai culture. So I'm um, going to tell you a little Maasai folklore. I'm still quite puzzled by it, trying to work out the meaning of it. It's called the elephant and the hare. Now, the hare was on the banks of the Mara River, and the elephant was heading to his father-in-law. There were two elephants, and the hare said, Oh, you're so big and so rich, and I'm so small, and I'm so weak. Please give me a lift across the river. The elephant was feeling quite giving, so it said, sure, little hare, picked it up, popped it on its back. Now, on the elephant's back was a gift of honey for his father-in-law. And uh, the hare, on crossing the river, could not help himself and scoffed all the honey. And then he said, oh, Mr. Elephant, give me some stones so I can throw them at the birds to protect your honey. So the elephant said, oh, you're such a kind little hare. Here are the stones. The, must, uh, the hare then put the stones in the, in the basket that it was carrying the honey and the elephant went off uh, to visit the father-in-law. Now, on arriving, they noticed that the hare had eaten all the honey, so they charged back towards the river uh, to take their vengeance. The hare saw them coming and ducked into a hole. Elephant immediately put his trunk into the hole and uh, tried to grab the hare and caught the hare by the leg. The hare laughed and said, ha ha, you've got a root. So the elephant let go of the hare and grabbed the root 
and then the hare screamed, you're killing me, you're breaking me. And uh, the elephant then tried to tug on the roots, but it was from a great big tree and couldn't succeed. The hare snuck past the elephant's trunk and ran. The elephants chased after it. The hare ran to baboons and said to, please baboons, protect me from this great rich, being the operative evil elephant that is trying to kill me. The, ele the baboons promised that they would. On, upon arriving at the baboons, the elephant said, have you seen an evil little hare? The baboon said, well, we will only tell you if you give us a cup of blood. The elephant agreed. The baboons shot an arrow, which is how the Maasai extract the blood uh, from a cow to drink, into the elephant's neck and started pouring blood into a gourd. However, there was a hole at the bottom and the elephants started feeling a little lighted and said, surely you have enough blood by now. And the, the baboon said, no, no, look, are you, are you weak? Are you scared? Can you not fill a tiny gourd? And the elephant eventually bled to death and the hare never had to worry about the elephant again. Now, as I said, I still can't make out the meaning of, meaning of that story, but I am doing quite a lot more research into Maasai folklore and culture. So I hope, <laughs> hope you enjoyed that little Maasai story, but we're going to say goodbye. Remember to keep an eye on the Facebook page and Twitter for drive times, as it can be a little bit confusing while we're operating in two different time zones. But across to Jamie, who's apparently competing with my fashion for the evening. I was having a little bit of a fight with my shuka in the winds, but it's okay. I think I've, I think I've got it under control, kind of. I had it really nicely positioned a moment ago, but it seems to not want to stay. Hold on, Dave. The race against the rain continues. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, we're back. Sorry about that. The weather seems to be playing. Oh, and I've got my speaker on. Um, oh, sorry. Well, here we go. Well, we can talk a little bit about my side culture again since I'm wearing my shuka and I have my sword. So a very interesting thing is that the age groups are separated uh, quite distinctly. And uh, the warrior age group, so from when boys are about 15 or 16, they actually have to live together. They can't live with their families traditionally and they have to prove their bravery. So when most people would run up to an elephant and go, hang on, I'm gonna get the hell out of here. They have to actually walk up and chase the elephant. The same goes for lions. And they have to do that till they're 25 and they're not allowed to get married till they do that. So it's a very ingrained to be incredibly brave um, in their culture. And uh, we will be going into depth about a bit more of Maasai culture as we spend more time here. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna be able to actually get uh, a Maasai in to come speak with us. I think that'll be quite a lot of fun, um, but we'll have to save that for another day. Till then, you're going to have to deal with me and my sword and my shuka um, from all of us here in Kenya. It's been wonderful having you on drive with us. And remember, you'll see Juma tomorrow morning. So from Jean-Rain and myself, bye.